And we're live. Hi, Mayor Rivera. Take it away. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening to every one of you. It is about that time to talk about Windows 10. The event just happened. Uh, this is pretty much the second preview that we are getting from Microsoft over the future of Windows 10. We saw a preview early, later last year, and today we get to see what it gets to look like on mobile, in addition to other devices that Microsoft announced today, and that we were actually only expecting one of them. And uh, in the end, it ended up being more. So let's begin with our quick roll call. Let's start with our editor-in-chief, Mr. Anton D. Notch. How are you? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I am fine, and I'm still trying to process all the information which Microsoft threw at us. That Windows 7 shirt looks lovely on you. Yeah, it's, I'm celebrating the free upgrade, <laughs> so that's why it is here. <laughs> oh, man, I wish I could find my old Internet Explorer 3 Midnight Launch t-shirt. It glows in the dark. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> then we have our editorial director, Mr. Michael Fisher. How are you, sir? I'm, a, I'm very well, and just like the rest of you, trying to make my mind soak up um, all of the information that Microsoft uh, revealed from, from Seattle, and also trying to deal with this aspect ratio. Sorry, I look weird, everybody, but that's what <laughs> happens when you break your other camera. Which was Lovely. Awesome. And is that a predictable Dunkin' Donuts coffee mug? You had best believe it, brother. Some things <laughs> can stay consistent. <laughs> Chief News Editor, Mr. Stephen Chenk, how are you? I am doing well, and finally stopped screaming in frustration over the issues with Microsoft's live feed skipping out on me. So cool, calm, and collected at this point. Can I share a, uh, can I share a pro tip about that that's, that's actually too late? Uh, I do. Had some skipping. I had skipping on my Windows RT device. I had skipping on my MacBook Air. The only way I could watch the Microsoft event without incident was to stream it on through Internet Explorer on my Lumia 930, and it was smooth as anything, even on 3G. I don't understand why, but it worked really well there. So next Microsoft event, you know, break out your Windows phones, everybody. Priorities, <laughs> priorities. Mm -hmm. Indeed, and I am Jaime Rivera, Multimedia Manager. We are going to discuss this as quickly as we can. There is a lot to talk about. Just remember, everyone, the Q&A is active. We already have one question live, and we're expecting you to chime in with your impressions and questions as well. So why don't we take it off with Stephen, since uh, between Stephen and I, we were covering the news. Tony was helping us on social. And uh, let us know how things went, Stephen. Let's begin with, uh, I think, our first news post was directly about uh, Microsoft making Windows 10 updates free for Windows 7 and Windows 8.1. Right. It's about the updates. This is a new version, the operating system coming out. So the question for a lot of users, I mean, some of us certainly will be buying new devices with Windows 10 on it. A lot of us want to know what's the path to get Windows 10 on our existing stuff. Now, Microsoft had already talked about making uh, Windows 10 available to Windows Phone 8.1 Lumia devices. That may have given some of you a little pause the way they singled out Lumias there. Granted, that's the lion's share of the uh, Windows Phone 8.1 market. Uh, but they confirmed, yes, all Windows Phone 8.1 devices will be getting this free upgrade to Windows 10. Maybe the bigger news, though, is on the desktop side of things. With smartphones, we're pretty much used to now getting our updates for free. It's just expected... Uh, on the PC, it hasn't been the case, but Microsoft is changing course of Windows 10. Users not only of Windows 8.1 will be uh, able to upgrade to Windows 10 for free, but even those who have been holding out on Windows 7 will be invited to make the free step forward to Windows 10. Now, the upgrades are only going to be available for free, at least as far as Microsoft has confirmed, for the first year that Windows 10 is available. During the Q&A, they sort of alluded to not having their plans after that set in stone. There may be some fee involved if you delay long enough, but if you don't snooze for too long, yet in the first couple of months, you can upgrade to Windows 10 for free, and once you're there, you'll be able to continue upgrading Windows 10 on this device for the rest of its uh, lifespan. So Microsoft is really committed to bringing pretty much everyone who's a current user of a, a Microsoft Windows product along for this Windows 10 journey. And that's really big news for the company, getting everyone on the same page, maybe for the first time in a long while. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's, it's what Apple has been doing with OS X for the past three years. Obviously, Apple sells computers, and Microsoft is barely only selling the Surface. I, I think it's a very good move. I just... I, because of how competition is with OS X, I'm not sure it's going to be sustainable for another year, but who knows, probably Microsoft finds another business model to make money out of Windows through. What do you think, Tony? 
Well, uh, let me start with devices, and I will be honest in saying that at one point my heart stopped because I really did not want to see another Windows Phone 7 to 7.5 to 8 transition where some devices do not get the latest version of Windows Phone. But luckily, Microsoft learned from their experience, and Windows 10 will be available on current Windows Phones that run Windows Phone 8.1, which is, I believe, a natural thing, and I kind of expected this. What came as a surprise was this uh, Windows 10 upgrade for PCs for free, and I think that this might have something to do with everything Tim Cook usually brags about when talking about Mac OS and how Apple is chewing up parts of the market share from Microsoft and Windows, and maybe Microsoft is trying to catch up with that and gain back some parts of that lost market share by probably losing some cash because Windows uh, Windows updates usually cost about a couple of hundred bucks. I don't know exactly how much it costs because I'm a Mac user, but still giving up that in order to get everybody on a unified platform as well as at the same time trying to get back some market share. I think it's, it's a smart move. It is. It is. I, I do worry I, there I, might be a downside to this in the long term that we won't see for a while here, uh, but Microsoft's been talking forever about how it might cut down on piracy with its OS on PCs, especially like markets in the East where it seems like more PCs are using pirated Windows than not. This idea of a subscription-based Windows uh, I, uh, system has been put forward. And a lot of the talk today was about uh, Windows as a service, not just a, a platform. And you bring everyone on board, get them all on Windows 10, get them used to these updates coming all the time. No one has to think about, am I on the latest version or not? It's just coming. Maybe three, four years down the road, this becomes a subscription, an ongoing subscription model where you're paying, you know, 100 bucks a year for continuing access. That's, this is just, you know, paranoid guesswork yeah. at the moment, but who knows. And it's, it's, a, it's a valid point. The thing is, well, Microsoft hasn't really succeeded in doing that with 365 up to the point where they dropped the price almost three times in less than a year. So I, I don't... But they're succeeding on Xbox Live with the same sort of business model. True, true, true. But I would love to hear Michael's opinion since he's the one with the Surface Pro 3. Uh, he is, yes, indeed. And uh, he likes it quite a bit. Uh, actually, uh, Stephen mentioned something before about with regard to those updates, um, you know, being coming sort of without user interaction. You know, that's, that's sort of Microsoft's vision they laid out. That everyone's going to be on the same version... Um, to, at, to at unprecedented levels compared to where it's been before. And I really liked one of the bolder claims they made where they, Microsoft said, uh, I don't know if it was Terry Myerson or somebody else said, that Sony hack, if, if everyone had been running Windows 10, that wouldn't have happened because protections are built in. Bullshit. That seal the vulnerabilities that were exploited for that particular hack. So I th that caught my attention. I, I thought that maybe that was going to be one of the bigger stories of the day, but of course then we moved on to even bigger ones, which I guess we should probably still talk mm -hmm. about. But, yeah, I, I guess the second biggest news, and uh, my opinion is going to come in a little later, but uh, Stephen, talk to us about Windows 10 on mobile. On uh, mobile, yeah. Uh, we got our first uh, real preview today of what Windows 10 is going to look like on smartphones. We only saw a, a few aspects of it, uh, but Microsoft uh, showed us the home screen, configuration, settings. Uh, it's sort of changes that a lot of users have been asking for for a while now. Um, it really uh, dove into apps for the majority of the presentation here, talking about um, the shared uh, code bases between PC and smartphones. A lot of time there was spent on looking at the Office suite. What's really nice is how um, Office, or at least Word, Excel, PowerPoint, is going to be bundled into Windows 10 for smartphones and small tablets. I believe the cutoff there was somewhere in the 8, inch eight inches. Above yeah. that, yes. uh, it's going to be... Pardon? Sorry about the time traveling. I said eight inches. I was just right. confirming what you said. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, but these smaller devices will have Office built in. You have it on your PC then. You can easily move back and forth in editing on uh, mobile and then on your laptop or desktop. It's the sort of thing Microsoft has been trying to do for a while now, but it looks like uh, with Windows 10, this is a from-the-ground-up idea. And by putting a word on the phones like this, Microsoft is able to take advantage of the a very advanced text editing features and sort of build it into other apps. So they were showing us a new Outlook client that has Word pretty much built right into the editing screen there. Um, that was also neat. You could see the keyboard moving around, a lot of more flexibility, I think, than what we've seen uh, so far. Um, and uh, as far as um, this might be getting ahead of ourselves, but uh, the, the preview of this 
uh, which we had been wondering when users finally get a chance to try some of this for themselves, isn't available right now, but next month is the ETA for users as part of the um, Windows Insider program. You can get this on their current Lumias, get at least some uh, early preview of how this is all going to function. Now, is it just me, or... I mean, Microsoft didn't really talk about the phone UI much. They focused directly on how Office integrates with it, and it was a really short presentation on phones. Is it just me, or am, no. am I being the only one skeptical here? It's not just no, you. They, I mean, it's, they it's, hit a few high points. Totally, uh, yeah, they, 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 we're going to have a, a dedicated Windows 10 on phones event at some point, um, you know, in, in a few months, I have a feeling, because you're right. I'm sure I, build this will be big. Yeah, yes, and almost no uh, time passed but before, like, Joe Belfiore is like, yeah, hey, check it out. You can Now you've got a wallpaper behind your tiles if you want it. Okay, now write on to Microsoft Word on your phone. Yeah, and I was like, bing, oh, bang. Yeah, man, come on. But there I, I, were some, some I'm things. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, there were some things that I did that I liked um, in terms of inbound messages that, that come down from your, you know, from the notification bar. You can reply directly to them in there, much like it is done on iOS. Yeah, you can pop the keyboard out if you're working with a large screen phone like the 1520. You can move the keyboard around the screen now. Um, Action Center, you can dismiss individual notifications. It looks like uh, recent apps have been moved to the top of the app launcher. And thanks to the PC notifications. Say, uh, uh, say again, Stephen. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. So they had a sync with uh, your PC with notifications across devices. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yet again we have this promise from Microsoft about now. Now phone is really going to sync with desktop. They're really going to play nicely together. And I started writing like a really cynical note as they were promising this because this is what we've been promised from from 7.8 to 8 to 8. I want. And now it it finally with stuff like that it looks like we're getting a taste of it. Yes, you're if you dismiss a notification on your Windows phone. It'll be dismissed on on whatever Windows 10 PC you're running and stuff like that. But you know, as, as, and then there's Skype integration right in the messaging hub, and, and which is which stuff. is the part that I like the most. How what Skype how integration in the, in the in messaging? Why why now? Explain that to me, Jaime, because I didn't get it. Okay, so what I missed from the transition of Windows Phone 7 to Windows Phone 8 was pretty much the the, the dismissal of Facebook as part of your messaging uh, hub. Right. So, and originally, you could use Facebook messaging integrated with a Windows phone. You didn't have to actually launch the Messenger app. It didn't exist back then. And so I, I, I missed that. I missed the fact that on iOS, you have iMessage, where it interact. you can either, it'll automatically select either, uh, you know, iMessage or typical SMS. And to my understanding, that's the way it's going to work, only it's going to use Skype, and obviously they're trying to push Skype further. And I, I like that integrated hub of just one messaging application for a mainstream service like Skype and SMS. That's what I like. Isn't I like it, it too. I just I, wish I knew more than 10 people on Skype. Sorry, Tony, go ahead. Isn't that <laughs> currently operates? No, it's got, uh, you know, the messaging hub is just, is just SMS at the moment, and uh, there's not the... Mm -hmm. You can't you can't toggle back and forth in the same thread between text and Skype. As far as as far as I know, this has been eliminated since uh, Windows Phone 8. So one of the reasons I think there was little emphasis or little time spent on Windows 10 on phones, because apparently it's going to be called Windows 10 and that's all, is either one of the following two options. Either number one, they didn't want to make this two and a half hour event even longer which I can understand because the emphasis was really on, on Windows 10 for PCs and on the holographic stuff, which to which we'll get later. Mm -hmm. Or I think that Windows 10 on phones is not yet ready to be shown off, and Microsoft is taking the time to further perfect the platform and make it ready for a maybe build or MWC presentation and so on. They're pro probably going to have that February preview thing going on where users might be able to send in some feedback, but I have the, this idea that it's not currently finished. As for the changes, I welcome the custom backgrounds, I welcome the flexibility included, but the, the user interface is the same, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you like the good old Metro UI back in the day, you'll still love it today. If you loathe it, you'll loathe it today as well. So there's little changes to the concept, but, but they're focusing more on the listening to the user feedback and trying to bring yeah. to they were complaining about. And don't get me wrong, Windows Phone might be a third in, in the top three platforms in terms of market share, but is a completely capable platform which you can use as a daily driver, 
give or take if you have a Google, if you're invested in the Google ecosystem. But then again, you can do everything on a Windows phone that you can do on an Android phone or an iOS phone. And that's, I think, that speaks pretty much well of Microsoft. Whether this Windows 10 update on phones will boost the market share, I would be implied to say no, but uh, let's hope I'm wrong. We have yes, a Q&A. In terms of that... Uh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Everybody wants to hey, Microsoft was making a really big deal talking about user input and the feedback it's been getting from people with the uh, the Windows 10 preview on the PC so far. So for those of you who maybe haven't seen what you wanted to yet out of Windows 10 on phones from the event today, have some ideas of where it should go or you don't like the look and feel about certain things, definitely get involved with the uh, the, the preview, the, um, the insider program when this goes live next month. Get involved. Let Microsoft know what your feelings about this are. This is the OS is not set in stone just yet. They're still working things out, and users contributing is going to help shape this into its final product. So to hear Microsoft, they really want to have all of us involved. So by all means, speak your mind and help craft this into the OS you want it to be. Jaime, were you going to try and answer the Q&A from Zodiac Fan? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. He asked, uh, do you guys think that the unified Windows will help close the app gap on Windows Phone? Uh, we've had a lot of discussions with Michael particularly. We've been using the Lumia 930 for a couple of days now. Uh, so far, as long as you're not invested in the Google ecosystem, i say that most of the apps that most of us use are there. Well, so, yes. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> here's the problem, right? Um, <laughs> You know, right. here, here's the issue. Yes, Jaime, that is true for me, and I've been making that point uh, re repeatedly uh, re of late. Uh, I have very little trouble using a Windows phone as my daily driver, but, you know, that's a whole other conversation. What I found striking with regard to this question is there was almost no move made to address the app ecosystem on Windows Phone at this event. And Tony, you're right, they probably didn't want to make the event run any longer. And yeah, so yes. there was a and a about that. Someone asked, what are you guys going to do to address this? And they just kind of gave a weaselly answer. Yeah, oh, did they? okay, I missed that. Yeah, it, so that was obviously not on the agenda today. And even more striking, if you live in the United States and you happen to use Chase Bank, this morning, like right before the Microsoft event, Chase Bank officially announced, or it may have been uh, yesterday, that they are no longer going to maintain their Windows Phone app and they're actually going to pull it from the <laughs> App Store in a week because oh, wow. they oh, just don't fantastic. have enough users. to just. And this is Chase Bank. You know, it's not a it's not like you know the, the your local <laughs> savings bank. Like a major bank is pulling an app from the Windows Store because they don't have enough users to justify keeping it in there. Now, you know, <clears throat> obviously that's not a death knell for the platform, but it's also a really not a great sign. Awful PR. Yeah, and and it's a reinforcement of all these kind of this, this is bad press, Stephen. Yes, that that we've been hearing about Windows Phone for a long time. So that's that's a shame. And the fact that Microsoft didn't have any good news to share with us, like say, even a, an Instagram update for Windows Phone to to get it out of beta and and bring it the two generations ahead that it needs to come to be current with Android and iOS. The fact that none of that was was shared, uh, it's 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 frustrating and, I, and scary. Perfectly agree with you, and I think that if in the beginning Windows Phone and Microsoft had an, an app gap problem, now it's not so much about the app gap because the applications are pretty much there in their majority. Right now, I think Microsoft is facing a problem where the applications are, are there, but the applications themselves suck. Either yeah. they don't work as they should or they look like crap, and it took Microsoft how many years to finally perfect a Spotify app, which came out two days ago, to finally make it look like on iOS. And we could go on and on with applications which are in there, including Facebook, which are far from their counterparts on iOS or Android. Yeah. And, um, uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I would... Just my, my, my one final point yeah. on this. Uh, this is all very true, guys. And, and just to close out my participation on a somewhat higher note, I have been using a BlackBerry Classic for about the past week, and after that, a Windows phone is just positively a vacation in the app. <laughs> it's so, all about uh, perspective, man. <laughs> Imagine using no phones and then using a BlackBerry. There you go. Well, it's the same exact thing, Tony. Right. Right. Okay. I guess my biggest complaint is, like, for example, I, I love Michael's video on the Spotify update yesterday. Uh, please, uh, viewers, make sure you watch it to get all the details on the changes. Uh, but I've been using it ever since I saw Michael's video. I downloaded I started using it. And but part of my, you know, my biggest complaint with Windows Phone that was not mentioned on this video, on this event, and that I mentioned in the After the Buzz of the Lumia 930 is either the excessive animations to go from one basic thing to oh, another. God. 
on Windows Phone is one thing. And the second is, Michael, have you noticed how it just keeps having to refresh Spotify every time that you launch it? It just goes uh, no, directly to... It, it, if, if you don't do anything but remain on Spotify, you're cool. But if you want to multitask from one app to another, every time that you go back to, to Spotify, it'll relaunch the app. Even though the music is still playing, it'll take you back to home. It doesn't take you to the current feed playlist that you're listening uh, to. Yeah, I think that was the conversation part. dating from back in the Windows Phone 7 point something days with application exactly. 2 building and, and whatever they called it back then. Yeah. Same time. Yeah, I, are, I, 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 oh, I'm sorry, Stephen. Go ahead, and then I'll, I'll finish. I don't want to derail things here, but these are you know ongoing issues with Microsoft's smartphone platform. Why don't we keep moving into what got covered on today's event? Because there's a lot more. That we'll exactly. See, there, there is a lot more to cover, Stephen. I don't want to leave this topic without mentioning something which we have not mentioned and about which I'm really excited. Uh, it's that Microsoft is bringing Cortana to the PC. And I'm not going to opine on that. It's just a, a thing worth mentioning. And the guys in the states and in the countries, regions in which Cortana is available will probably appreciate it. Sadly, not in my region. But that's a, a smart move, I think. Yeah, yeah that's actually that? is that next? That's actually that's the next topic actually, and I I covered that post particularly. Um, Microsoft is has done some amazing things with Windows Phone, uh, particularly for example on Lumia Denim, you can just call and say, "Hey Cortana," with the phone being turned off, like you can with the Moto X, and it'll activate itself. But you know, they're not just launching Cortana on the PC and making it the same thing that you have on the phone. They're actually making Cortana better. Uh, it actually has context on uh, whatever information you provide to Cortana about you, but in addition, it also searches within documents, and it... Shoot, it just activated itself. <laughs> Thank you, Cortana. <laughs> Thank you, Cortana. Um, it actually digs into PowerPoint presentations, Excel sheets. If you're looking over uh, for a particular information within documents, it'll do that for you, which is something you can't really do on OS X. Surely you have Spotlight on OS X, and it'll dig through these, these things, but there is no Siri on OS X to allow you to use your voice and bring that information up, which is really cool. And uh, they announced other different changes. Like, for example, if you're going through a web page, and uh, you look for a, pr a particular restaurant or stuff, it'll, Cortana will automatically give you directions to the place, dietary information, and just about it, almost every single context that it can pull from that web page and whatever it is that you're looking at. So, yeah, it, it is smarter than what you're getting on your phone. I think, I think the coolest... I'm, I'm sorry, Stephen, go ahead. I'm having trouble getting really excited about this because, like, I am a big fan of Google Now, Google Voice Search, interactions with my phone. You can do that on your PC with Chrome, but I just don't. The idea of talking to my PC, for some reason, is a lot less appealing than the idea of talking to a mobile device. I'm not sure why that is, and if it's just something that we as users will have to get used to. But I can yeah, imagine I this being it. a little less appealing. Stephen, I well, think that's, that's, I think it's just something we have to get used to because I share your your view. Where I saw my friend use Google Now on his laptop the other day with Chrome, and I was like, oh, that's making my head just we'll, feel weird." We'll but come around, yeah. To, to get used to, because Microsoft made the example of the tired old example of the office assistant. It's like having your own secretary to you know and just tell her to to do stuff or whatever, and uh, I, it works. I guess Go ahead, Amy. I guess where Cortana is different is that just like you know, in the case of Google Now, it'll pull information the more you use it and understand what you're looking for, but Cortana is specifically on, you know, it, it, how can I say this? Whenever you're browsing for something, it'll already give you information without you searching for things. So it's not just the fact that you can call on Cortana through your voice, it's the fact that it's interacting with everything that you're doing and providing additional information. It's adding value to whatever it is you're doing with the computer, and I guess that's where Cortana has a, a difference with Google Now. Good point, and she is also integrated into the new browser, not just the PC, I should mention. So, yes, that's true, in support yes. of your point. She is in a lot yeah, of we're, we're, I'm not necessarily we're, we're, excited about this feature. Just just one sentence, Jaime. Uh, I, I appreciate the fact that Microsoft found a way for the user to eliminate certain things out of Cortana's knowledge, because if I would actually care enough... I don't care, because that's my type of person. I don't care about my privacy that much, like other people, but Cortana is really the NSA on your computer, your local NSA on your computer. It's there, watches, listens, and learns everything from you. 
about you. And if you just don't want Cortana to know something about you, you just delete some references and that's it, she forgot. True. I, True. I think in a, in a broader sense that if this is important because Cortana is one of the best, I think, one of the best things that was included in Windows Phone 8.1 and for Microsoft yeah. to take that and move that to the desktop where historically, I think, Windows has been kind of less exciting and a much tougher sell, especially with Windows 8 to people, I think it's a very, very smart move and I think it's going to make, make a, a good amount of people happy. I think it's going to play into this Microsoft push to make Windows an experience that people move from, I need Windows to, uh, okay, I should get Windows to, I love Windows, and I think Cortana is going to play a big part in that. Are you are you trying to answer the question that we have on Q and A right now, where uh, Source CY is saying, Michael, as as we all know, you love Cortana. Is the availability of Cortana on Windows make you move from from your MacBook Air to a Windows device? I think it, I think it'll take more than that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not going to be that much long. I think in about four days, my MacBook Air is finally going to erupt in a, in, a, in a pile of, of flames and black smoke. <laughs> but uh, I already use the Surface Pro 3 quite often, and not for any purpose, like review-related purpose. I just use it often because I, I actually quite like it. So I don't really need much pushing to, uh, to, to move to a Windows device part-time, at least. Here's, good, here's a question good. for you guys, and a quick question, I just want a yes or no answer. Do you guys think that Apple will introduce Siri in the next version of macOS? Yes. Oh, yeah. it has to. Yeah. Yeah, it has to. It has to. I just, I find it so surprising that Apple has not talked about Siri in the past, like, three events. <laughs> yeah. So, it, it could be that, uh, it could be that uh, Craig Federici is just letting this be a Scott Forstall thing. No, if I were <laughs> Apple, I don't, I'm not sure. It I really would need some new... Recently, anyway, I'm sorry, Stephen. You and I are having a, a latency yeah, it's, delay. It's, it's getting its years. ass kicked in the press. We've seen all yeah. these analyses where independent researchers put all these questions to Siri, to Google Now, now to Cortana. Siri, it, it may have been really impressive at first, but everyone else just seems to be really outdoing it in you know real life use cases. So, Apple may just be waiting until it can, I don't know, freshen Siri up with some improved functionality before it wants to put emphasis on it again, but took the something words needs to get. Yep. Apple, Apple, usually, Apple usually does that. That's just the way it is. It, either, it can either improve it initially or, or it leapfrogs eventually. But uh, uh, streaming back to the topic, how about if you run, the, run us through the, you know, the emphasis on gaming from Windows 10, Stephen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... A uh, couple things are in interesting that are happening uh, with Windows 10 that will have an impact on gamers. Of course, the connectivity between different devices is going to be big. Uh, Microsoft is all about social interactions when it comes to gaming. It really wants, it wants to put Xbox Live first and forward as this way for gamers to interact with each other, to share their accomplishments, to just, you know, shoot the shit. And it's going to uh, introduce people on phones, talking to users on consoles. Xbox One is getting upgraded to full-on Windows 10. Uh, users on PCs on Windows 10, those on their phones on Windows 10 can all talk with each other. Depending on the games, able to play with each other. You'll be able to stream games from the one to your Windows uh, PC or tablet. And it's all just uh, about this overarching, connected, social ecosystem for gamers. Uh, one thing that was really interesting is um, the way that sharing uh, game videos has become really big in the past years. Twitch has blown up larger than anyone's expectations. On the Xbox, there already exist these uh, really useful tools for sharing video of your accomplishments with your friends. That's coming to the PC. And I guess correspondingly to phones, so it wasn't really talked about as much. Um, but the ability to capture video, to then share it, uh, it's going to be baked right into the OS. So no need for you know, hacky drivers or third-party utilities. Microsoft really wants to give gamers the tools they that they've already been using uh, to put them right in the OS. And uh, something that Microsoft was talking about, how they don't want everything to seem like a bolt-on in Windows anymore. They want this to be really integrated with all the features that users use on a regular basis. That's going to be uh, present uh, with the, the gaming focus here. We also heard about DirectX 12. Uh, not a lot technologically was uh, offered there besides better access to hardware should give games higher quality or better performance. They threw this 50% improvement figure. Whether or not we see as drastic improvements, that remains to be seen, but no matter how you slice it, it's going to be very impressive and accessible on, on more devices of different types than ever before. 
Am I the only guy that's thinking that uh, this is pretty much a response to Sony's PlayStation Live uh, initiative that never went live? Actually? Yeah. No, you are not the only one thinking that, no. <laughs> I mean, uh, for the difference here is that at least the PlayStation Live platform, whenever it does work, will work on OS X as much as it can work on Windows compared to what Microsoft is intending with, with the Xbox One, right? I have more faith, though, from Microsoft being able to pull this off rather than Sony. True. True, I think the definitely. more Microsoft d- does in gaming, um, the the better off they will be. I know there's been a lot of talk, a lot of speculation about them spinning off the Xbox unit. I know there's a lot of business considerations. There's financial stuff that I don't fully understand. But every time I walk into my living room and the TV is on and the and the Xbox is like, oh, hi, Michael, because it recognizes my face, and then I tell it to do things with my voice, I mean, it's it's just epically awesome, and it works much more smoothly than a lot of large screen Windows uh, Microsoft products have for me in the past. So Yeah, the way the 360 and now the Xbox One have evolved past a, a pure gaming console to this sort of connected home device is, yeah. it's probably where you know, PCs, just computing in general is going over the next couple of decades here. It's given Microsoft a great inroads into this. I think it's early access, trying out new technologies like Connect, HoloLens, which we'll talk about later, but uh, it's it's been a great experimentation platform, and I I, I, I like I've heard like you have these talk about getting split off. I can't see that happening. It's just been too valuable to Microsoft, and it's probably only going to keep on being valuable in the years to come. I'm actually waiting for two things. Number one is for Tony to tell us how much he doesn't play games. Tony, yeah, please. Absolutely. I was about to say I have no opinion on this because the last time I played games, I was probably in the eighth grade. <laughs> okay, thank you, Tony. Uh, going back to the topic, <laughs> we we do have a oh, Stephen's got a, uh, we we do we do have a um a, a nice segue opportunity here into another large screen Microsoft device that was uh, announced today. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the phablet. Yeah. I, I'm, no, I'm actually going to talk about the Surface Hub, but um, I guess the only bit, closing down the whole Xbox concept. I'm just waiting for the product to go live and for your computer to tell you, oh, you need a beefier processor or more RAM for all this Xbox integration to work. I'm just waiting for that. But anyways, moving back to the topic, one of the major things that was announced today, so Microsoft announced two different products, two different hardware products. I'm not sure how important these products will be to us particularly because these are, well, at least one of them is, but the other one is really uh, more of a, it's a, I don't know, it's a big TV. It's an 84-inch TV with a 4K display and integrated computing. It's got multi-touch, multi-pen input. It's got advanced sensors. It's got built-in cameras, speakers, microphones, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, NFC, etc. It's called the Microsoft Surface Hub. Um, and, well, it, it's really for business users. It's, it enables two things, which is one, brainstorming, and another one, which is meetings. Uh, with the Surface Hub, for example, you can pretty much project the whiteboard um, in a room, and that whiteboard is based on Microsoft OneNote, and the reason why the whiteboard concept is cool is because a whiteboard is there, and you can either only erase what you have, or, you know, you can't really scroll down a a physical whiteboard, and you can actually do this with this uh, Surface Hub. Uh, It also allows, you know, different types of collaborations with OneNote. Uh, It syncs instantly, and it integrates with Skype for Business for you know, you can actually have conference meetings and you can actually activate a meeting with one button. Microsoft was making a lot of emphasis over how meetings take up to 12 minutes to start, where here you just have to press a button, even though in real life it'll take 12 minutes for us to press the damn button. Um, <laughs> and it just, that's just the way it is. But probably one of the coolest things is you can also project whatever you have on your phone or tablet with the Surface Hub or the computer. And you can actually manipulate and operate everything from the Surface Hub and not necessarily have to operate things from the phone or from the tablet. So it's a cool little neat product that shows us where the original Surface concept, you remember that big table? Uh, <laughs> yeah. You remember I've forgotten that? about that with all the yeah, tablets. you remember that big table from the past? This is pretty much the maturity of the original Microsoft Surface, yeah. the fact that they've, be, they've been able to create this productivity tool that will most likely cost $10,000 whenever they launch it. That's, That's my problem with this thing. Is I don't like how embedded it all is. It's an all-in-one device. I think Microsoft could have... The smarter move here would have been to do something like an HDMI stick, maybe with an accessory like the Kinect that plugs into an existing... Maybe not necessarily 4K, but a high-res HD TV, because these will yeah. already exist in conference rooms. It would just make it a lot more accessible, a lot more affordable. That's not to say that it doesn't look very impressive on its own, but 
Microsoft's choice. Yeah, but you know, they, they were talking such a big game about uh, making it, you know, how, how the Surface Hub was so so innovative and it made everything so easy and it's all one touch and like, oh, look, you take the stylus out and it automatically starts the dry board app. And, well, of course it does. If it didn't, then it would be dumb. That's that's table stakes. That's not crazy innovation. I was expecting um, some some innovation that we of the caliber that we did see on the original Surface concept where, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I think you could, like, put a phone down on that, on the you original Put a phone on the table. Camera yeah, or a USB stick. And, and, right, these, like, yeah. bubbles would rush over to it, and then it would be like, oh, here's a device, and it would pulse, and then it would be like, okay, now I'm talking to the device. And we haven't seen anything like that, either from the Surface Hub or anything else. That, so I, I think there was sort of a missed opportunity to really blow us away with this, and I, but I do understand the impetus for doing it. You know, that Microsoft does want to sell their services. They want to be the company that's like, oh, yeah, we, we have to use OneNote, so we have to use this Microsoft thing because it, it works really well, and it we can snap it alongside a Citrix thing and take this diagram and drag it over here and drop it into this node, and it's great. And it, it's nice to have a, a Halo kind of showcase for that, but I don't think it's going to be a moneymaker for and let's And let's not forget that this, this product is not for you, me, nor probably anyone sure. Oh, oh yeah, so, no. So Microsoft is trying to appeal to those business consumers, business customers, enterprises, which they are not. I'm not saying they're on their way of losing them, but they really need to come up with a product, this product, to um, to keep those customers happy. So absolutely. Th- we, we, we should all get that hub, so why not? Let's all brainstorm using a hub. It will probably take up half of my room, but no, <laughs> it's it's not for us. Or it's for the business enterprise consumer. Maybe those enterprises uh, which have different offices in different uh, parts yeah. of the world and so on. It's, it's not for us, but yeah, they could have done a little bit better. I'll tell you this much. I, you know, I worked for two enterprises, UPS being one of them, and these companies spend a lot of money on services like WebEx. I mean, a lot of money. Um, and I, I feel that, as Michael said, this is really a missed opportunity. Or, sorry, Stephen, where you know you're forcing people to buy this humongous display, and yeah, it's cool. I mean, you can't really just project something on a TV and doodle on it and use a stylus and use it as a whiteboard, too. That true. That's that's something you can't do, but. You know, if Microsoft would have used this as a platform, they would have had a much easier selling point with a small stick and a stylus than, you know, to try to sell us this huge $10,000 or whatever that thing is going to cost. But uh, let's just segue into something that is consumer-based, something that I know a lot of people have asked for, and it's a new Microsoft browser. Um, And I'm still skeptical over if this is really another Microsoft, if it's another browser, because at no point, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, because I I was having a lot of stutter with the screen. At some point they say, this is a new browser, or this is the future of Internet Explorer. No, I believe this is replacing Internet Explorer. Yep, IE is dead. Yeah, it's got a new rendering engine, a new look and feel. It's it's, it's ground up. Yeah. Yeah, so this is pretty much uh, the the solution that uh, Microsoft is providing to everybody for, you know, br- the browsing problem with Internet Explorer. People complain that it's either too slow or, or that it's really not on par. And it, I mean, but the thing than, is, you know... But more than browsing, it's a branding problem. I know Internet Explorer has come a long way in recent years, but it still has this awful reputation going back a decade or more. It's, it's time Microsoft started fresh. Yeah, yeah, and so, uh, okay, so cool features. Like, for example, uh, Project Spartan allows collaboration. Uh, for example, I don't know how useful this is going to be, but you can actually take, like, it's not a, it's like an interactive screenshot of a web page, for example. You go to Pocket Now, and probably you want to discuss with your friends this cool new post that Steven just posted, and so you can doodle on it, and if somebody doesn't have a stylus, then you can use your fingers, oh, or if somebody's on their or if somebody's on their phone, you can probably use your finger there, or a keyboard if you don't have a touch screen. It allows collaboration, and it even allows you to share uh, web pages very easily in a sort of a way you can do so currently on Android. You just press the share button, and it gives you different options to share things, which is cool. Yeah. Another thing. Another thing. Yeah, I know. I know. I mean, ahead, uh, th- 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 but that's my question. Like, it's like. Uh, you know, for, for enterprise, maybe I could see that's cool. Like, the, even the way Joe Belfiore kind of demoed it, it it, it reminded me of of like a, a Google Wave presentation or, or something, or even just like a Microsoft Office thing. It's like, look, you do an inline annotation, and then your whole team can see what your comment is and stuff. And it's just, it, it struck me as as utterly 
uninteresting to anyone outside the enterprise. Um, True. But m maybe I'm just being short-sighted because, but I can take an Android no. phone or an iPhone or a Windows phone, screenshot a page, and do the exact same thing. I don't understand why I need to, why I would want well, to do it on a web page. Well, here's the thing. Right now, only only Samsung phones and LG phones actually provide that functionality built in. Uh, so the thing is, this is pretty much Microsoft making it a universal thing for any Windows product, uh, which is like, for example, if you want to take a screenshot on an iPhone and doodle on it, you have to take the screenshot, take it to a specific app, doodle on it, but it's not interactive and live. So I'm not saying that it's useful. Good point. Good point. I'm, not, I'm not saying that it's useful. I'm just saying that Microsoft is making this the new standard, and it's going to go across platforms. So it doesn't matter if you have a Windows phone, a Windows tablet, a Windows computer, you can do these things even if you're never going to use them. <laughs> I do like that there's an integrated offline reader now as well. Uh, and, and, and that's actually what I was going to mention. So there are two other things that we're going to mention. Number, sec number two is the reading functionality. And I was like, oh, so first of all, you get a built-in reader, which you currently already have with Chrome and Safari. Uh, there is also a built-in reading list, uh, which has already exists in Safari for the past, like, three versions, where you can actually read things offline if you want. Cool. But... You know, currently, this is like answering the question to the lack of pocket on Windows Phone. And it's also got built-in PDF support uh, as part of the reading list, so you can probably find the PDF uh, or if a document that you're looking for on the web is actually a PDF. You can save it for offline use as well. Couldn't you always just save web pages for offline viewing? Yeah. Could, but it's really cumbersome, because what it does is it, it saves the HTML file, and then it saves this, like, huge folder... Yeah. Uh, on the side, and, and the problem with that is that works on the computer, but it doesn't work on tablets or it doesn't okay. work on phones currently. So it, again, it's yeah. just finally bringing a, bra a Microsoft browser on par with what you can do do with Chrome and Safari. That's really it. Do we know That's really anything it. about the differences in the rendering engine? I don't mean to ask something Nothing that we didn't was cover. Mentioned. In the Nothing prep. was mentioned. Okay. It, it was just me it was just said that it, it's it's uh, more on par with the current engines that we see, but it, it didn't say how faster it is. For example, yeah, like for example, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, it doesn't say how faster it is. Like for example, you see in an iOS presentation, it'll tell you that the Safari's new Java Java rendering engine is five times faster than the competition, and we've actually seen how battery efficient, uh, you know, uh, OS X uh, Yosemite is with uh, Safari compared to Chrome, for example. But we not, none of this was mentioned today. And I that, guess, that is the key point. I think that 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 is exactly the one thing they should have mentioned because while doodling and sharing and collaboration is good to be there as an option, which you probably use two or three times within five years, I'm exaggerating, of course. You right. are browsing, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually only one. <laughs> you are browsing the web every day for multiple minutes or multiple hours, and you want to spend that time uh, mostly in consuming content and not waiting for the browser to load the content. So I think that uh, the speed rendering and details like this should have been in the presentation because everybody wants to know how fast Project Spartan is compared to IE, how fast it is compared to the competition. Sure, but today wasn't a very technical event. I think if we wait till build, we'll get those answers. Probably. Yeah, and I, I, we actually have a we actually have a Q and A question from Shahadat Parvez, who's asking us if Spartan seems like a better option to Chrome. And you know, just to give you a quick answer, probably the only differenti differentiation between uh, Spartan and every other browser is the Cortana integration, which is the third thing that they mentioned. And we already discussed this, the fact that Cortana looks within the context of a web page and uh, provides you useful information without you having to call on Cortana. That's probably the only thing that goes beyond what print browsers can do. And Michael, what were you wanted, wanting to say? I don't think that's true, Jaime. I mean, we, we, we talked about a lot of stuff that Spartan is supposed to be able to do that other browsers can't, but, but Cortana is certainly the most visible, so I sort, I sort of get what you were saying. Uh, this question the question is interesting to me because it reminds me that the browser wars, and it should remind all of us, that the browser wars never really ended, you know? I mean, in my personal experience, I started with Internet Explorer, I got really fed up with it after a couple of years, then Firefox came into the public consciousness, I was like, oh, wow, this is way faster and lighter, and I used that for a couple of years, and then Chrome came up, I was like, man, Firefox is really slow, Chrome is really light and fast. And in the past year or so, Chrome has just gotten so laden with 
yeah. with bloat. And uh, yep. their most recent update tripled the amount of clicks it takes for me to go from one account to another within Chrome, which is this annoying thing that Google keeps doing. It keeps making things heavier and stickier and nastier. Yeah. And so I'm very much looking forward to trying Spartan, but I think probably 60% of that reason is just because, oh, it's new, and they haven't gotten a chance to screw it up yet. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm looking forward to the next two years on it. <laughs> I know, and I guess the ba the main reason why I'm a, now a full-time Safari user, even for this Hangout, is because, my God, I could do, use the battery, and it really won't cripple the battery like Chrome does. And mm. that was one of the biggest complaints about Internet Explorer, how it would just make your fans go crazy on any Microsoft laptop. So, so yeah, that's that. But in a nutshell, this is what Project Spartan is. Uh, we don't have an ETA for us, but we will keep you posted. How about if we move the spotlight on this... Tony, I don't know if you have any other final opinions on this. No, I'm good. <laughs> I guess we should move over to what everybody wants to hear. The holographic, hololens mm. uh, thingy. And Stephen, please, I I'm sure you fell so much in love with this that you want to talk about it. Yeah, this. so th with the past year now, we've seen this, maybe even more than the past year, uh, really Oculus uh, got this started with the Oculus Rift, and this renewed interest in virtual reality, technology's finally gotten to the point where it's, we're able to build devices that have the resolution, that have the speed, to make this approaching something that's attractive. These aren't like your 1993 clunky and not even texture mapped VR graphics. This looks nice. You just have been doing this in the PC with Oculus for over a year now. It's moved into phones with things like the Gear VR. Microsoft, out of the blue, has decided to take this to the next level with this self contained system. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, they're calling the platform uh, Windows Holographic. The hardware is the HoloLens. It's a headset that has its own CPU processor. This isn't something like Gear VR where you plug it into your phone like Oculus Rift, you plug it into the PC, you put this on your head, and you're inside this augmented virtual world. Uh, the idea then is that you can see uh, this uh, display overlaid upon the, the world. Uh, you can reach out and touch. They had a really impressive demonstration today uh, with a user creating a 3D model by just reaching out into space, grabbing at pieces and applying them to this model. And it looks very uh, interested, interesting for designers. Gamers, of course, are going to love this. Uh, the ways that we'll use this, I don't think we can even fully appreciate just now. Uh, Microsoft talked about scientific implications. It's working with NASA to have a simulation of what, uh, what we'll be like on Mars when we finally send astronauts there. Uh, we don't have a lot of technical details on the HoloLens uh, hardware just yet. Microsoft... Uh, talked in general about how it's going to have, uh, in addition to the CPU and GPU, is a special holographic processor designed for taking information about the real world, helping decrease latency, uh, making this as fluid an experience as possible. It's all hugely ambi ambitious, and we're just really barely touching upon it here. Um, we're super concerned about price, obviously. Uh, this is very advanced-looking hardware, and we don't have a great sense yet of what it's going to cost. Microsoft insists that it's going to be affordable for home users as well as you know, corporate customers, but until we really see you know, maybe a formal announcement of or a, a special event just about HoloLens, we don't have all the details just yet, but my God, this thing is impressive-looking. Impressive looking. Tell me something. Am I the only guy that saw that video of how they were building that quadrocopter to be fake? You know, just, <laughs> I mean, just, just an acting really setup. Mean, I, mean. I mean, everything was, first of all, everything was projected on a separate camera. Which um, I, it, you could it, possibly do if the, the API is as robust as they're making it out to be. No, it guys, just, everything was so that, fake. That camera had the glasses on, and that's why we could see the projection. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I don't know. There, there are there are technical confinements to doing a presentation like that, where you're like, it, it'd be like us uh, when we were talking about getting a Google Glass unit when they were new. We were like, wow, okay, well that would be fun, but uh, we're going to spend fifteen hundred dollars. Oh. How are we going to be able to film it? How are we going to be able to see the interface? Sure. When we yeah. figure out, you know. So I understand. You know, you, you have to. It was just like when they were showing off Windows Ten up for phones. You know, they were like, okay, 
uh, we can't run this because the code is so young, so we have to show you an animation that approximates it. I mean, you know, it's whatever. I, I get it. I trust them that the end result is going to look close enough to the simulation that we yeah, don't have to worry to about. It's just our appetites, but I think they did a really successful job of doing that, even if this isn't exactly how it's going to, to look I think, and feel. Though I will say... Oh, uh, go ahead, Tony, and then I'll say my well, I was about to say that I think that this was the highlight, and this... this Took it home for Microsoft. Absolutely, but, uh, it's super exciting. It's super futuristic, and I'm super excited about it. It's just that I don't think that it's for the kind of it, it's not for the kind of user like you and I are. It, sure, it's for the professionals, for doctors, for fashion designers, for astronauts, for you name it. It's for the kids for gaming, but for a prosumer like us, a guy yeah. who's not in an enterprise, not a businessman, but it's mostly working on a device, it would not be that useful to see Jaime on Skype while looking at my kitchen table instead of just looking at Jaime on my screen. Not only that, I mean, I, I, I like the concept, I like the idea, it's great that the knowledge is going forward. It's, like it it's just like, for example, that whole quadrocopter thing. I mean, currently designers use a mouse and their hand is on a table. And so it's resting on a table to be able to, you know, manu manipulate that same design with a mouse pointer and have it done compared to holding things, well, holding nothing, your hands in the air. I mean, we've discussed over how cool Kinect is, but how people stop using it after the gimmick phase. Well, not using, not stop using it fully, but y people just don't like raising their hands in the air to do things because people get become tired of doing that. Yeah. You know, go ahead. I'm going to circle back to, to Tony's objections there about I don't understand the, the use case for this. I'd rather just Skype on my, my PC or something. And we were talking earlier about um, with the Surface Hub and uh, how businesses would use this for you know, teleconferencing and stuff. Remember when this teleconferencing first really took off? And yes, it can be very affordable. It can connect you with users around the world without having to jump on a plane. But there was this pushback that business, like, executives really wanted these face-to-face -face meetings. There was this value placed on the traditional sitting around a conference table together. Think about what you could do with this, where instead of looking at everyone on a screen or on your laptop, you're putting on the headset, you're sitting down around a table, and it looks like they're sitting there at chairs in the same room with you. Everybody wearing that. <laughs> yeah, well. Everybody in their underwear. Everybody in their underwear. What if this was the size of Google Glass, though? You know, something yeah, that's yeah, yeah. We'll get there. Actually, Stephen, I, I have a sort of a counterpoint to that. Like, Google Glass is is nowhere near the capability level of this. I want to acknowledge that up front. Oh, this is a you know this is a, fly, a a trailblazer for a new platform and an entirely new way of thinking about everything from gaming to meetings to personal computing as a whole. Like, I mean, this is a much more impressive product than Glass is conceptually. But I was forced to even as I was watching their demo, even before we knew that a headset was involved. As I'm watching the demo video, and <clears throat> it's very craftily showing holograms sprouting up from furniture and things like that, and it's all very cool, I was stealing a glance at the actors in the video and the headgear they were wearing, and Microsoft was very craftily shooting this thing. The, it was minimized. There was a lot of shadow on the heads. From behind, a lot of... Yeah, them. a lot of from behind shots. But even as I... Before that video was even finished, I think I tweeted, I'm like, man, that headset looks like... That's some intense headgear you got to wear. It to looks a little heavy. It looks... Yeah, man. I mean, so my, my point is that, you know, people didn't want something even as relatively sleek and light as Google Glass. And some of it was the camera, some of it was the price, blah, 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 blah. But some people just were like, no, that's too weird. I don't want to put that on my head. I don't see something like this taking off any faster, um, but, you know, because of that, that, that physical inhibition. No, the, I guess the difference is the usage case scenario. Google Glass is totally designed different. to I know. Yeah. Google Glass is designed to be something that they Google wants you to wear every day, whereas uh, you know the Hololens is really designed for specific usage scenarios, like you know a conference call, like we're talking right now, or building a specific thing. And you know, once you're done, you take it off. I just I, the, I, minute, the minute we're having a conference call like this, and all three thumbnails down there are wearing that, I'm just leaving the conference. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, uh, yeah. Well, we wouldn't have to. We'd have little avatars, so we wouldn't be seeing each other. We'd be seeing each other's avatar, and then then that way it would be very cool. Because I would be like really buff in like a Starfleet uh -huh. uniform. But, but, and, uh, but, and well, well, wait a second. Wait a second. So we're all gonna be blue and wearing this long ponytail. Uh, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and speaking and speaking Navi. 
<laughs> <laughs> well, you know, guys, I, I guess I guess we're done with the rundown, right? It's well, been sorry, I mean, but Hollow, I guess we, we're, we can't be done with Hollow, right? There's a lot of people asking questions about it. I know, there's, I know. And while you find your questions, there's there was an awesome, excellent tweet from, from our colleague, Adam Lane, who was very excited to meet, guess who? Hollow oh, Cortana. Yeah. No Hollow Cortana. Why didn't we say that? Oh, good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they they had to do, when they released Cortana in different markets, they did enable different voices. So I imagine that when we when we see this, because we know we will, you'll be able to choose what you want Cortana to be, whether, whether it, because they still own the, obviously it's an Xbox property, it's a Microsoft property. They can make real Cortana, but also... They'll probably have a dude Cortana. They could probably have like, a dog <laughs> Cortana. <laughs> paper clip. Yeah. Oh, a clippy, a clippy Cortana. Yeah. Yes. That's a way to go. Absolutely. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, we, we've already given our our opinions on Hololens so far, answering Shahadad's question. We have another question from Source CY asking, uh, "What browser do you use right now?" I well, I, we already mentioned that. And uh, when is part, Project Spartan available? We still do not know. Uh, another interesting question from Kevin Alonso says, do you guys think that uh, with this new push of services, they might finally start playing nice with people who use Google? Um, that's actually the other way around. Yeah, it's not oh. Microsoft that's 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 the problem. Yeah. They, they, Google is, you know, is throwing up roadblocks at every possible opportunity. Even and with this SMS Skype messaging integration, are we going to see Hangouts pop up in there? I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> and I mean that would be that's like one of the last great unicorn dreams for me of the entire mobile world is that someday Microsoft finds enough finds a way to either throw enough money at Google or or somehow get Google to play nicely with integrating Google Apps and and Gmail and all that kind of stuff with Windows Phone because that would you know oh my God I mean I, I wouldn't even have to carry an Android. Phone. They will naturally do it and I think it will come from Google's side whenever Microsoft and its Windows Phone slash Windows 10 on phones platform becomes big enough to be a significant player in the game. Right now it's Android and iOS. Windows Phone is somehow negligible in Google's cards. No, but I know, but you don't think that that's exactly what Google, the status quo that Google is trying to preserve? Like, they don't want to see Windows Phone become another competitor. Exactly. So they will probably be able to offer their services to Microsoft whenever Microsoft manages to gain a larger chunk of the market. They will you know, have that was to do it. I, I was thinking about that today. I mean, what is it? Why is it? I think that with the Windows space being so significant. I, I, I was thinking, you know, what? why is it that Google is so reluctant to provide, you know, Microsoft a little bone here? And I think it, it has mainly to do with the fact that Microsoft competes directly with Google in search, which is the core business of Google. Oh, I wouldn't say Bing, and, Bing and Bing Apple doesn't Bing. do that. And Apple doesn't do that. No, I mean, Bing search has a, a relatively insignificant market share compared to Google. Uh, True, but it's it's, 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 it's ranked right? it's ranked it's ranked the second search engine ever since they are using Yahoo <laughs> Yahoo Information. Well, yeah, yeah it, is, it is the second, but yeah, it has yeah. a small chunk of the market. I know one is ninety percent, as the and the other one's ten. I'm not gonna argue yeah. on that one. But the you know, go, going going through other Q and As, for example, Dex Eve's question was already answered. The next question from Source CY about Cortana on Xbox. What do you think? I don't see why that hasn't already happened, to be frank. I mean, you know, we're, we're, then again, we're just seeing Cortana hit the desktop now. We know Microsoft is not the fastest moving company, so just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it won't happen. I think it's very likely to happen, and I, I think it should, as for reasons we already mentioned. I think Cortana is a great product and needs to be on as many Microsoft products now, as possible. I don't have any uh, direct experience with the latest Microsoft consoles, but you were earlier, Mike, Michael, were mentioning how you can just talk to it now, it's responding. Is it functionally that different than Cortana? Cortana as it stands? Uh, you mean with the voice interface on Xbox? Yeah, yeah it is, um, yeah, it is. just because you're using it more like, uh, on the Xbox with Connect, at least the way I use it, you're using it more more of like a vocal mouse pointer. You know, it's like Xbox Select, Xbox Go Back, Xbox Go to Netflix. Okay, so it's not like a natural language where it's, you're asking, it's right. responding, there's no back and forth. Right, and to be frank, it's actually quite quite inferior to Cortana in far, insofar as understanding goes. Like, very often I'll be like, you know, Xbox, play Grand Theft Auto V, and it'll be like, okay, sweet, what do you want to search for on Bing? I'm like, you're... <laughs> 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 we have 
we have another interesting question from Jovair Ben, who says, MS said, Windows 10 upgrade... It, no, wait a second. Not, that's actually... We already discussed uh, free for a year. Uh, <laughs> we have another one... Sorry about that. We have another one from Steve who says, I think Spartan, uh, Spartan is more of a rebranding of Internet Explorer than a new browser. I think be. so. Because they were not giving us any information on the, on how better this browser engine will be. Can we? Can I? Can I bring up? Uh, there's a question. Another question from Steve. The audience seemed so bored at the event. A big difference from an Apple event, and that is um, that's very true. And true. it's not. I don't bring it up just to just to be snarky and be like, oh, Microsoft, you're dorks. But like, it's it's really frustrating to me that most times when I watch a, a Microsoft event, the presentation is is I find it to be lacking. And I think some of the products are really worth getting excited about, but um, th th they tend to, when they go bold in a presentation, they tend to go bold in a really, really nerdy way that's not <laughs> not really, you know, they, these jokes that kind of fall flat, and even if they do mic the audience, which I don't think they do, you know, I, I don't think there would be a lot of engagement there, and, and it's frustrating, you know, and it's certainly not a problem unique to Microsoft. A lot of companies suffer from this problem, but... It, and as Samsung demonstrated a couple of years ago with the Galaxy S4, it's really easy to go the other way and just do that completely <laughs> wrong. So this is not an easy thing to do, and I don't mean to yeah. trivialize it. I just like every time, time, every time we feel like we're losing the crowd, mention the Seahawks, and we'll get a chuckle out of them. Right? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Or like, oh, a Joe Belfiore hair joke that always plays great. Like, put yeah. throwing yeah, a in there. I'll, I'll tell you this much. In 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 Microsoft's defense, um, Apple events are are number one in a much larger venue. Um, most, a lot of the people in the audience are Apple employees. Uh, you yeah, know, but they all do the, Yeah. Uh, all that, and, and, and Microsoft is usually the 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 serious nerdy guy. Why Apple? Well, Apple is always the nonconformist, the the yeah. artist. The, and, and it's losing their DNA. I, I'll tell you this much. I didn't expect the audience to go crazy over like something like the Surface Hub because you know once you project something that's really for the enterprise, how happy can consumers be yeah. about something they're not going to buy? That's just the way it is. And the way they portray, portray the whole uh, Hololens, you know, they focused everything on how this is going to help NASA, and everybody in the audience must have been like, "Oh, uh, I guess I need to change my job." or something like that, if I want to use a damn HoloLens. I mean, can we answer this other one from Dex Eve? I know we kind of covered Cortana a lot right now, but this, this is a question that pertains to Windows Windows 10 um, in, in terms of... directed to you, so go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael, what do you think about Cortana being implemented into your desktop space? Question open to everyone else. Like, what do you guys see the benefits to you having a Google Now type assistant in Cortana? I think we sort of covered that part of the question already, but... If you notice the way Cortana is going to be integrated into Windows 10, um, she's got a persistent search bar right next to the Start button. And one of my favorite things about OS 10 on the Mac is that you can just hit Command Space and you have the Finder. You can pop up and search for anything instantly. And if Windows 10 indexes the system as quickly as Mac OS 10 does, and I don't know if it will or not, that's going to be really, really nice. It's going to remind people that that search bar is there It's because it's, it won't disappear. It'll always be there. And then when they click into it to search for something, they'll be reminded that Cortana is there. And then ideally, I think Microsoft is like, well, then why am I even typing? Cortana, search for, you know, what, Sound Studio and open it up. You know, so I think that's going to lead to uh, a, at least a unique... Uh, user experience. I don't know if it would be worth it to you guys. Would you guys find something like that useful, or do you prefer to type? No, I prefer to type. And but... the things that I search for on my PC are rarely natural language words. Like, I'm not going to say find Photoshop. I know what that is in my start menu. I'm going to look for, like, <laughs> right. find file X2347J8P. Right, right, P. right. So right, right, right. Exactly. Out. But but if you're sliding into your chair, like if you're coming in with a with a fresh cup of coffee and you're across the room and like if I'm five steps away from my computer and be like, hey Cortana, open up, I don't, I don't know what what do I use? Fucking uh, open up iTunes or no, open up Xbox Music and it, it have the app open by the time my butt hits the seat. I think that's cool. It, I think it's I, cool. It's hard for me to get excited about it, but it's I'll take it. Why not? Hmm. I'll tell you this much. Probably my biggest complaint with Siri, Cortana, Google Now is the accuracy. At, you know, my English is not bad. And even so, mo not most of the time, but some of the times it'll get it wrong. And mainly because of that, I'm like, oh, I'm not going to even ask because, you know, there is a 50% chance it'll, that it just won't understand what I'm asking hmm. for, so I might as well <laughs> type it. We did see, uh, we didn't mention this in the Windows Phone section, but we did see finally 
Cortana starting to understand punctuation now, just like you can do oh, an iOS yeah. and Android. It's like, yeah. hey, everyone, exclamation point, everyone ready for the party, question mark. That, I do that all the time on Android and iOS, and I, it bugs me that I can't do it on Windows Phone, so I hope they make that system-wide in Windows Phone, because like two minutes after they did that demo, Joe Belfiore tried it in the messaging app, and it wanted to automatically detect punctuation like it currently does and is not very good at, so I'm like... No, no, that, that's the big... That's the biggest problem. And speaking of Windows Phone, uh, Steve Lamont has this question that I really wanted answered at this event. Uh-huh. I guess not. It says that they say flagship phones, plural, coming this year. I rewound I that bit three or four times because it kept skipping on me, trying to hear exactly what was being said. <laughs> I don't. Uh, but Microsoft said we're going to get flagship phones. I think that's a plural, but from them and other companies and later this year at some unspecified date, there's really nothing I could pull out of that that was an interesting factoid besides oh. new phones will arrive at some point. And we didn't see the exploding tile thing when you hover your thumb over a tile and it, and it blows up. Like, they oh, didn't yeah. mention didn't that. See anything. Uh, I want more Windows Phone news, but we don't have it. No. I was to ask, did you guys find it a, a fake like I did, the entire conversation between Joe and, and Cortana? Yeah. <laughs> it seemed way too good. Oh, way, yeah. too good, way too scripted, and for me, that part was fake. Not necessarily the the Hello presentation, but that conversation right there between Joe and Cortana, that, that was like somebody's on the other end and talking. So, oh, no, well, so yeah, you, that was definitely staged. So you think that was yeah. just the recording? So you think yeah. that was just the recording? They yeah. just had Jen Taylor do a couple mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. inserts for them, and then they, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and go, ahead. go ahead, Michael. No, 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 no. I, I was reactively making noise to hold the floor for no reason because I'm a jerk. Go ahead, honey. <laughs> I, think, I think that, uh, I don't know, it's like, for example, Shahadat has a very interesting question that I think would help us wrap this, wrap this uh, hangout up. He says, what do you think? Did Microsoft fulfill enough expectation as rumors were very high this time? Uh, I, I think this is a really good way to end our, our editorial roundtable. I don't know about you guys. How about you, Tony? No, I, I think that, that the buzz is definitely there, and I've been seeing, catching a glimpse of my Twitter feed, and definitely their stocks went sky high, but that's how usually things happen with presentations like this. A lot of exciting stuff to show, and maybe we are a little bit underwhelmed because of the fact that we are mostly covering phones and tablets and wearables, and we've heard a little too close to nothing about those, and that's probably going to explain it. Um, I forgot what the question is, so I'm just going to ramble on. (laughs) (laughs) I think a lot of exciting things, and I think there's going to be at least other exciting stuff coming on at MWC and at Build. You guys answered the question. I have no idea. Well, it definitely, is. Tony. Yeah, okay. I'll go last if Stephen wants to go. Yeah, I think we got more or less what we were hoping for here. We heard that this would be a focus on cross-device connectivity, especially with gaming on phones. We got that. The only rumors that didn't really... Uh, I mean, there's, there's certain features we haven't seen yet, but we can always see those at a later date. The only thing that we didn't get that was, I think, directly teased was news of this weird hardware uh, laptop phone combo. It only came out recently, this rumor, and the fact that it didn't end up panning out I don't think is a, a huge surprise. But yeah, I think you know 9 out of 10 delivered on expectations here, especially with uh, Windows Holographic, which no one was looking... I mean, we thought they might have some sort of VR thing, as, but no specifics behind this. The fact that we got this at all, I am just very excited, more than I thought would be coming out of this. So good job, Microsoft, I think. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll piggyback on you with that, Stephen. I think a lot of people were going into this event with um, sort of small expectations, and, and not not in terms of, uh, you know, diminished expectations, but just small in terms of thinking. Like, oh, are we going to get, okay, we're going to get a new browser, and uh, Windows 10 is going to be a new desktop OS, and we'll hear something about Windows Phone, and maybe they'll give us a watch. And, you know, that's kind of the way we think a lot of the time, because you're conditioned to be like, okay, what's the next product? What are we going to cover, cover, cover? And Microsoft instead wanted to tell this story about Windows transforming from an OS to a lifestyle, and people's relationship to it going from utilitarian to love. And, you know, a lot of that is to be expected, the kind of hyperbole that marketing departments kind of spin out, and certainly um, when Satya Nadella spoke, there was a lot of buzzwords being used, and a lot of seamless, seamless being tossed around. But you know, they backed it up with 
first with this Surface Hub, which I think was kind of a red herring. It was like, oh, okay, here's the new hardware. Okay, it's a freaking whiteboard. And then 20 <laughs> minutes later, they're like, no, but actually, here we go. Boom, Windows Holographic. So they backed it up with that kind of excitement. They backed it up with some some cool stuff like a new browser, some other stuff. So I think in the end, yeah, they, they met the, uh, they met and exceeded most people's expectations, but <clears throat> only in the long run are we going to be able to tell if, uh, if, if those expectations will continue to have been met because I have no idea how that holographic stuff is going to pan out. And because I, I volunteered to go last because we currently have uh, a live viewership roughly four times the size of the average Pocket Now weekly live stream. So Ooh. tune in for the podcast on Friday, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. That, that's actually, uh, you know, I wanted uh, Michael for you to give us a preview of what else we could expect from the podcast on Friday. Yes, absolutely, and and we can expect uh, a lot more of Stephen talking uh, and telling us exactly what went on. Uh, maybe some some cursing. I imagine Jules Jules Wang will it will fall over uh, onto his side on camera for some reason when we talk about Microsoft. And uh, Stephen will actually will will actually have our thoughts a little more condensed. We'll be able to. What hope? And also, yeah. by then our thoughts will, will be more clear. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. So, uh, yeah, tune in for that on, on Friday afternoon. It'll be a lot of fun. Pocket Now Weekly okay. Podcast. Can't wait to hear and watch. I guess my final expectations, uh, uh, a little teaser for whatever you're going to see later on today on the Pocket Now Daily Microsoft Edition, because I guess we the, the only good news or the good impression that I have of this event is that it wasn't just one thing that Microsoft is showing that they are bold enough uh, to expand to new markets, even though those are enterprise, uh, to bring new daring products, even though we still debate if these are going to be useful to us at some point. But I like this Microsoft. I like that this is not the typical Microsoft that's focusing just on Windows and Bing. I like this. Um, so my expectations were met to a certain degree. I guess my only disappointment is... Again, no devices, no mobile devices, no, you know, no enhancements and no growth in hardware when it comes to the existing things that we can buy right now, which are phones and tablets and computers. Uh, hopefully, we will see more on this at MWC 2015, uh, and uh, we will keep you posted. Guys, thank you very much for joining the editorial roundtable. Uh, such thank a pleasure to have you all here. Tony, particularly you, what time is it in Romania, dude? It is 11 p.m. Uh, get to bed. It's no, he's not, he's not going to go to bed. It's Wednesday. Tony, tell him where you're going from here. <laughs> Straight to bed. It's been a 17-hour workday for me. Oof. Damn. Well, okay. So, everybody, uh, please, uh, you can follow. Uh, all our taglines have our different places where you can follow us on Twitter and different social networks. And, uh, again, stay tuned for our Pocket Now Weekly this Friday and our Pocket Now Daily later today. Thank you very much for your Q&As and joining. Uh, and uh, we will see you on the next video. See you guys very soon. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.